What's up everybody, how's it going? It's Burke aka Dan's Great here and welcome back to more from this playthrough of Five Fantasy X in which I try to complete the game using auto battle only or if that fails using only the attack command. It's been a really fun time to try this out and the response has been absolutely fantastic and it continues to be very well supported so of course thank you to everybody once again. It's been a real breath of fresh air for the channel and I've really really enjoyed doing this and I'm looking forward to trying to do more from this challenge and maybe bring you more like it in the future. So without further ado, let's continue. And as you guys have been so far, if you are enjoying the content, please remember to drop a like and show the video some love to help it continue to do well as we progress even deeper into the story of the game and head towards some of the most difficult boss battles the game has to offer. So we finished things off in the Calm Lands and managed to defeat Defender X as well. And with that, I decided to actually go into the Sunken Cave because I was curious at what I could fight in there and I wanted to meet Yojimbo at the end of it as well because I assumed that if I can beat Defender X then Yojimbo should also be doable and I was just curious to see what I could collect along the way. Because of the groundwork that I'd done to beat Defender X I was pretty confident to just sort of sprint into the sunken cave and see how we do in there. And so the wonderful theme in here begins, and I made a little bit of progress along the sphere grid before I got started, but in general I think my stats were more than adequate for being able to get through this particular part. So let's see what kind of things we're encountering. Now the first thing that we came across was actually the Magic Urn, and it's a very frequent encounter here. Now this is another place where because you can't escape encounters at the moment, you're going to have to deal with that attack that hits everybody for about 1,500 to 2,000 damage once you get it wrong. So if you don't have the kind of stats to survive that, and you're not healing in between, then you cannot really make much progress in the Sunken Cave. So it's a pretty important part of this whole thing to be able to survive that particular move. So before long, I encountered a second Magic Urn. As I say, it's a very frequent encounter here. And when you have Auto Battle, it automatically targets the middle eye. Now, according to the mechanics, there's a 40% chance that you get a wrong instantly happening. But later on, what I actually found to be very interesting and something that I potentially could use later was that if you attack the middle eye, which we do by default anyway, you actually have a chance of getting a free stamina tablet. So one of the most difficult things of this run so far has been, of course, to get certain specific equipment that normally you would have to steal for. Now, any challenge run that I've done in the past, usually I just steal with Riku, and I end up getting a few of them by this point, and I kind of keep them in the back pocket for whenever I need them for a challenge, or if I want auto potion, then I have to grind a bit harder. But usually Riku is the early game method for actually getting the stamina tablets. Now in this run, I later realized that actually the magic urn can give you stamina tablets. So if you just hang around here and you're strong enough to not be kind of threatened by the monsters here, you can actually farm for stamina tablets in this challenge, which is really interesting. And the magic urn is pretty much the only way to obtain them through random encounters, which is really cool. But as you can see in general, I was working my way through the enemies here. Nothing was particularly challenging. Even the elements with their high defense, they weren't proving that difficult because of my piercing and the general strength that I had at this particular point in the story. Now, another reason I wanted to spend some time in the Sunken Cave was because there is actually a chance that you can get yourself a No Encounters armor, which would be absolutely huge. And it was another one of these crossroad points in the run where I was like, should I just kind of sit here and try to grind until I got a ghost, defeated the ghost and was given a no encounters armor? I definitely could and maybe it would have taken me, I, maybe I, I would have been lucky and it would have only taken me 10 minutes. Or maybe I could have been unlucky and it could have taken me quite a long time. But I thought to myself, you know what, I've got this far without something like no encounters. I was feeling pretty confident and I was like, you know what, let's just take on Gagazette without no encounters and see if we can manage it. So that's why while I was in here, I kind of hoped that I would get lucky and I would pick one up, but ultimately I never ended up getting a no encounters here. So I made it all the way to the end of Sunken Cave and it was time for me to have my showdown against Lady Ginnam's Yojimbo. Thankfully, you only need four stamina tablets in order to customize an auto potion. So like I say, magic urns end up being a very powerful method of farming stamina tablets and because they're so frequently encountered, it actually wasn't that difficult either, which was really useful. So that's something I definitely kept on my mind for my time here and for the future of the playthrough as well, if I ever needed it. So once I made it towards the Ojimbo, I was deciding whether I needed to farm for like auto potion or anything like that or the no encounters. Ultimately, I decided against all of that and I thought, you know what, let's just go straight for it. 
and take this guy out because it doesn't have that much HP. Maybe its evasion would be a little bit high and it could be a little bit of a struggle to hit, but once the battle actually got going, it became pretty evident that it wouldn't be that much of a problem. And once again, that theme just begins again. The Sunken Cave is a really cool place for the soundtrack. Definitely some nice ones here, especially on your first time through. My only concern in this battle was that what if its overdrive gauge charged up so quickly that we end up having to face a Zanmato before we could take it out. But as you're seeing the battle flow here, due to my stats and the general like agility and stuff that I have, and the accuracy that I have, it's enough for me to land consistent hits on Yojimbo. And with the damage that I was doing, it became clear within like 5-10 seconds that this battle would not be a problem. Because that overdrive gauge is, is going up very slowly, as you can see as well. So, no particular problems here. And once you see Yojimbo slump, and he's not, he's not anywhere near halfway on his overdrive gauge. I pretty much knew I had this in the bag. Then Titus came in with a critical and was like, yeah, this guy's getting absolutely destroyed. So that was the general story of the Sunken Cave. Now, interestingly enough, if um, depending on how much farming you've done to get this far, if you somehow had a huge, huge amount of gills, so I'm talking 750,000, you could actually come here and recruit Yojimbo and pay him three times his asking price and get two more teleport spheres if you really wanted to at this stage of the game. Uh, depending on like what you've done with your teleport spheres so far, it is a, it is a method to get them that wouldn't really exist um, in any other way, but odds are, even if you've done some grinding, you're not going to have that much skill. But it's something I kept on my mind for later, depending on how far I could get and what was necessary. It might have to be like a really long-winded way to get a teleport sphere if you didn't want to do the Blitzball League, which is also something that's going to take a long time. So it's, it's again, something to kind of keep in the back of my mind. But while I was here, of course, I didn't bother with anything like that. I did check out the rooms on the sides, though, to see uh, what the treasures were, because I'd forgotten at this point. And so I made sure I grabbed those. One of them, I did know one of them was a flexible arm, which is a weapon for Riku that has four free slots. But since she wasn't really a part of the, the kind of, I guess, attacking force at this point, it didn't really seem that necessary, so I kind of grabbed it anyway, but I was ready to leave pretty soon afterwards and continue my path up Mount Gagazette, which was bound to be a little more interesting than Sunken Cave, because obviously the, the sheer amount of encounters that you face there and the caliber of enemies also another little step up from what you're facing in the cave. So with that, I was ready to move on. There was a lot of, of course, like cutscenes and all that stuff, but thanks to the cutscene skipper, I was able to rip through those, and before you know it, I was ready to begin my ascent up Mount Gagazette. In terms of preparations, there wasn't really, especially along the mountain trail, I don't think there was that much I had to watch out for. The only aspect that I felt could cause a problem was the potential confusion from the Grat enemies that you face here with the, with the seed burst. And other than that, it was mostly just elementals that could cause a threat, so fire protection and lightning protection could also have been a potential help here alongside uh, confusion if you do have the protection for it. So that's the kind of stuff I was generally looking for, but especially for Tidus, I don't think I had anything particularly great here to protect against the enemies here. But for Kimari at least, I went for confusion because there wasn't anything that could petrify you here that I could remember. So it was worth kind of prioritizing that as we move forward. So Kimari again, he had a little bit of built up sphere levels, so I was cashing those in and trying to basically be strong enough because I knew what was awaiting at the top of Mount Gagazette and it felt to me like once I did get there it was going to be another kind of level check because I won't talk too much about it right now but you can already imagine what's going to happen uh, once I get to the top and I have to face Seymour Flux so uh, we'll deal with that when we get to it first of all we had a pretty uh, arduous trail to get up here before we get to fight Seymour Flux at the top so I had a little look at the at the shop anyway uh, just see if there was anything that I could use. Now, if you really need some free slots, you can definitely find them here. Everything has two free slots. So if for whatever reason you hadn't been picking up um, anything, especially the armors, they're pretty cheap. So since I had a ton of gil, I thought, let me just keep those in case I need to customize something specific in the battles ahead. And with that, I was ready to go and try to climb the mountain. But, of course, before all of that, there was a little bit of a Ronso issue that we needed to settle against Biran and Yenke. This one, honestly, I kind of had no clue how it would go because there is so little that I can do 
and as you can see they guard each other when they're on the same side. So I thought this might actually end up being a serious problem. So my first attempt here you're seeing, especially when they're together, there is basically nothing that I can do. It doesn't matter how strong I am, the level of protection that they can provide is too high for me to do any real damage here. So as you can see, I didn't really get off to a good start. But once I connected my first hit, it became clear that I could actually do a really good amount of damage when the two were separated. So it was a matter of seeing if I could kind of hold on for long enough and take them out before they took me out. So let's see here how this first attempt went. But it's already not looking particularly good. And I was starting to think ahead saying, do I need to use something like Auto Potion on my armor in order to survive these guys? Because at the moment, it looks like they're gonna, they're gonna be too strong for me to handle. And without being able to heal myself, this is looking like it might be a step too far for Kimari. He also uses Mighty Guard, which again halves that physical damage. And I thought, you know what? These guys are actually a weirdly like difficult matchup. Normally, they're never really a problem. And because the game scales them to Kimari stats, they shouldn't really ever be overpowering you. But with this particular setup, as you can see, I just didn't really have enough. And I was thinking, what can I really do here? And then I thought, you know what? These guys are using a lot of elementals. And if you noticed, I put the Lucid Armlet on. So I kind of jumped the gun and I disrespected Buran and Yenke. And so I thought, I need to change my equipment for Kimari. So I kind of went back to square one and had a look at his equipment again. And I thought, you know what, a lot of their hits are elemental, so I should probably just go for my trusty fire armlet, which is something, again, I, I told you guys, make sure you pick this up, because it's still proving useful, even on Mount Gagazette. So I didn't even bother to work on Kimari's sphere grid here. Um, I got a bit excited, because I was really like just looking forward to, to trying it again with this new armor. And so I was curious to see what I could do if I had the elemental protection to, to go with um, the stats that I had. So... I took them on again, this time with the Fire Armlet, to see if that would be enough to defeat them. So you can already see immediately, Thunder and Fire Breath were doing half damage. Unfortunately, Aqua Breath is one of the most powerful attacks you can face, and I was still taking full damage from that. But ultimately, the fact that I could take half damage from Thunder and from Fire Breath and Blizzard ended up making the difference, and on this second attempt, I had a much better run. Now also what was pretty important and clutch here was this critical hit from Kimari, which really did help to speed things up. Now, can you win without any criticals? I think you can. Uh, you're gonna see it ends up being pretty close here, but I do have maybe about 500 HP left in order to be able to win. So I do think that even without a critical, you can probably still get it done, but it would have been very tight. And it might indeed be the case that you can't win unless you get at least one critical in this battle. But thankfully, in the second attempt, I managed to get through with the Fire Armlet and landing a critical on Biran. And with that, I was actually able to start climbing Gagazette properly. Now, again, experienced players will know that one of the main perks of fighting Biran and Yenke is that if Kimari knows Steel or Mug, he can steal level 3 key spheres from those guys, which is really useful because they are quite hard to come by, even in this later stage of the game and they are the key spheres that allow you to break out of your general region of the sphere grid. You can break out with some level twos as well, but they're kind of, I would say, quote unquote, lower level breaks to really truly break the sphere grid open and start to access basically all of it for any character. You need those level threes if you're not using stuff like teleport spheres to get around. And so obviously, as a result of the nature of this challenge, you're not able to steal any level three key spheres. And so that was something I was actually a little bit curious about where if I did really need to push my stats to a very high level to defeat a story boss, how many level 3 key spheres could I pick up along the way, and how many locks could I break in order to access as much of the sphere grid as possible? So it was a question for the future, but for now it didn't matter too much because I was able to get through, and it was time to climb the mountain and see if I could make it to the next major boss battle in the story. So I switched back to my previous setup here and I got back onto the Lucid Armlet because still I, I felt that Confusion was the bigger threat because my guys are kind of a bit glass cannony right now. Um, they do have a lot of strength and as a result if they do get confused it's really deadly and they can pretty much one hit KO each other so we have to be very careful here 
with something like Confusion. And as you can see, Confusion Protection is difficult to come by. By just relying on drops, it's very difficult. And you can't really get musks as drops from anything that you encounter, especially not at this point. So Confusion Protection is actually one of those ones that's more difficult to get until you reach pretty much the end game. So Confusion was probably the status I was most scared of at this point. But I had to give it a go anyway and just see if we could manage to defeat things quickly enough to not have it cripple us too much during the ascent. God bless cutscene skip. This area, man, with all the cutscenes that you have to face as well and the sheer number of encounters, it really is a grindy area. And for that reason, it's, it's potentially like a really bittersweet area. It can be pretty frustrating. And I do wish that they maybe designed it to be a little bit more slick. It, it's, it is a little bit grindy, I have to say. Especially in like later years when I started to do more like challenging stuff. Uh, when, it, when an area is already pretty busy and grindy for a normal playthrough, when you're doing something more challenging, it just it's like exponentially worse. So definitely one of the, the tough areas of the game. But um, with that said, as you saw from that first encounter, it looks still to be like pretty much smooth sailing. And the, the big threat still for me at the moment was, was something more along the lines of confusion affecting me badly. So I was still curious to see how that was going to go. But with that first encounter, I, I was feeling pretty confident. I did briefly consider giving Yuna first strike, but honestly, she was doing so little damage at this point that in terms of like the challenge, it wouldn't really affect anything because if she comes in first and does like a 50 damage, it, it changes little at this stage. So I thought, you know what? Let's not waste a return sphere at this point. The reason she's there is because of the stone proof and mostly the auto feelings for this particular segment. So let's just keep rolling and see if Kimari and Tidus are enough attackingly to get this done. So this encounter here was another one that I thought could be a little bit problematic if I can't take these bombs out in time. And I'd forgotten how much self-destruct damage they do and whether I could take them out. But as you can see, Tidus is just absolutely beasting right now. And so when Tidus and Kimari together, they're doing about 10,000 damage. It did give me a strong sense I would be able to get to see more flux with relatively little problem. I started to get the feeling that it was pretty much gonna be the areas, the final areas of the game. Like with these particular stats, I think it would take something like the Inside Sin or the Omega Dungeon random encounters to truly give me a really tough time and put me at risk of getting game overs regularly. The Gagazette Fiends didn't seem like they were up to that kind of standard and so I was starting to think, yeah, like all I need to do is just keep grinding here and I should be able to make it through to um, Seymour Flux. So I had another little look at Tidus' equipment here, but there wasn't really anything that I felt was that useful. Eventually, I did decide to go to the Lightning Proof and SOS Null Blades just as extra protection. But with the damage that I was doing to the bombs, it, it really felt like it wasn't that big a deal. Now, this encounter here was the one that I was afraid of because I thought this is, this is the one where I could get confused. But as you saw here, I mean, Evade Encounter kicking in and Tidus basically needing one hit to take them out. And Tidus and Kimari together attacking me was enough to take them out as well. The only potential threat would have been something like an ambush, but it didn't happen in that particular encounter. So again, I was able to breeze through. And with the with the encounter that scared me the most out of the way as well, it was pretty much, it felt like the, the path had cleared for me to get to see more flux here because these guys were just, uh, they weren't strong enough to really give me too much of a problem. I was curious to see if I was able to get fireproof at this stage. So I had a look at this uh, red shield that I got. And yes, so once again, elemental protection is one of the more difficult things to get, like high level elemental protection. So it was nice to see that fireproof being dropped for Tidus as well. That was definitely useful. These guys can also drop Mega Phoenixes, by the way. So it's another kind of potentially mini kind of farmable thing because of course you can't go back to face the machines at the high bridge. So as you saw here, I did get a lucky rare drop here of a Mega Phoenix, but um, it wasn't something that I ultimately needed here, but it was good to know that I could pick them up here if I needed to do that particular grind. So really, there was only one more encounter left that could pose a potential threat, and it didn't take long before that one appeared. The Double Grat plus the Bashura. Now, it's actually quite fortunate here, when you do encounter them, the Grats are on the right side, and that means that your auto battle guys will attack them first and make sure you take them out before they can confuse you potentially. So once again, very quick here, I took them out before they even landed a move. And with that, it was only the Bashura left. And as you saw, my characters are so quick at this stage and they're doing so much damage 
that even the Bashura couldn't get a move in. So as I say, at this stage it was really just looking an absolute formality that I would get to see more Flux and I was starting to already think ahead to the battle and how, how that could play out and what I would need and what kind of farming I could do and all of that kind of stuff. So I was pretty excited at this point because see more Flux is always such a like highlight of any playthrough. Um, sometimes in a good way, but oftentimes in a bad way as well, where a lot of people will struggle a lot against Seymour Flux. Over the years, I've had people tell me that they've given up at Seymour Flux, and all of that stuff, honestly, is understandable, because if you're playing the game for the first time, maybe you're not using guides as a total blind run, you're inexperienced with Final Fantasy games, or maybe you've been running away from a lot of encounters, so your levels are pretty low. Seymour Flux is a pretty legitimate step up from what you would have been facing in the past, and so I can definitely see why people would have found him very difficult to defeat. And honestly, in this challenge, it could potentially be no different. So I was curious to see, because things were going very smoothly, but I did have a feeling that because I knew what Seymour Flux could do, it might actually end up being a super tough encounter that could cause me to get stuck here for quite some time. So as I continued my climb, eventually I ended up making it to once nearer the top of the trail. And I was curious to see what equipment I could buy from him because he does have expensive equipment, but there are some things there that would be pretty difficult to, to get or even impossible to get and customize yourself. So it was definitely worth a look to see what he had to sell. But before actually speaking to him, I decided to have another look at the sphere grid because basically at this point I was, I was at Seymour Flux. So I wanted to really see what my stats are looking like and whether I had a realistic chance of being able to win this battle. So I had a quick look here. Uh, Yuna, again, attacking me, she wasn't really going to be able to do anything, but she was definitely strong defensively and she had very high magic defense, which could prove useful in this particular encounter. So as you can see, uh, strength-wise, we're doing very good in the 50s and agility is over 30 and we just have to see if that's going to be enough. Now, the final thing I did was to move Tidus along the sphere grid a little bit more as well. I had built up a lot of sphere levels for him, and I thought, let's just keep going for a little bit here. And basically, at this point, Tidus is at the end of his own designated sphere grid. As you can see, up ahead, there is Quick Hit, and Quick Hit is basically the final move that is within his own sphere grid, and he needs a level 3 to break out and continue along the sphere grid. Generally, the game is expecting you to get to this kind of range by the time you get nearer to the end of the game. So I got here, of course, a bit earlier than you probably would in a normal playthrough because I had to focus a lot on Tidus and we had to do the farming and that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, I don't have any level three key spheres. Like I say, the game does not do a good job of giving you them up until this point. And because I couldn't get them against Viran and Yenke, I was kind of stuck. But as you can see here, there are a couple of points along his grid where you can use level twos to get out instead of level threes. So that was a good sign because eventually it meant that if I did want to break out and keep boosting my stats, I wasn't only restricted to Tynus's portion and there wasn't like a, a hard barrier on how far he could go with his stats. So that was all good. Uh, I had a quick kind of scan of the grid here. Where could he break out? What would be a good point? But ultimately I decided to just kind of wait and sit on the, the sphere levels that I had at the moment. And when the time comes, I can make a decision on where to break out from and what kind of stats I wanted to pick up. So. This one I'm showing here was for Yuna, and that's not ultimately the best one for him because it's more about magic and magic defense. But we'll see when we get to it. For now, let's have a look at once and what he has here. I brought the conductor straight away because I thought initiative is a good one. Normally you need chocobo feathers to get initiative or you need to get a weapon drop from the cactars. And so I thought, you know what, an initiative with that many free slots, if I decide to use Yuna basically full time as a, as a frontline member, having the conductor would be a good idea. So I definitely brought one of those and I did have a lot of guild to play with, so I thought, why not? Alchemy, once again, extremely difficult to get. One of the hardest weapon abilities to get in the entire game in this run. Alchemy weapons are only dropped by two enemies in the game. The first is Crawler in Makalania, and the second is actually Dark Cindy. So <laughs> there is literally nothing in between that drops any alchemy weapons. Also, the healing waters that you need to customize, they're literally not dropped by anything, and they're not given as an award for anything either. So you can literally only have three alchemy weapons in the entire game. One is brought from once, the other one you have to get lucky from a crawler drop 
And the third one, you have to beat Dark Cindy and get lucky with the drop as well. That's how rare alchemy is in this particular run, which is really interesting. And again, something that I would have never really thought too much about until I tried a run like this. So that was one of the most important things I wanted to buy. And there's a couple of interesting things here, like SOS Haste as well with two free slots. And Zombie Ward is also good to have potentially as well for the battles ahead. But the good thing here is also that he sells Holy Waters as an item too. And since we're facing Seymour Flux and later on hopefully we can get to Unaleska, Zombie would be a status that we'd be dealing with. So the fact that he sells Holy Water and also offers a couple of things that have Zombie Ward on them was definitely a nice boost during the run as well. So once came at a good time and he definitely had some useful things on sale for pretty much any run and especially this one as well. So after a few more minutes of this, I did make it to the save sphere before Seymour Flux. And before I went in, I decided to make some sphere grid decisions here because it started to feel more and more like Yuna had to be a true part of this challenge. And again, thinking further forward, there were mandatory battles that she had to be a part of. So after a time, I, I got to this particular stage and I was like, you know what? Her sphere grid is not the best suited for increasing her HP and strength, which are like two of the main things that we need in this challenge. And so I thought, you know what, I do have a friend sphere. It might be worth breaking Yuna out of her sphere grid in order to get her more relevant stats that could help her in the battles ahead. So basically, I wanted everyone on the, sim on the same kind of grid if they were going to be fighting on the main line. And you can see there's a lot of strength spheres around this particular area. So eventually, I decided to move Yuna over to this part of the sphere grid to help boost her relevant stats even further instead of wasting time working on things like magic, MP, magic spells, magic defense, that kind of stuff. Especially at this stage, Yuna was very lacking in the in the strength department, of course. And so I decided to move her along and start to boost those stats as well. And so that was the general idea I had for Yuna. And I felt that this was going to be a time where I needed to start cashing in these, um, these sphere levels for Tidus and use it to break out of his grid and to see if I could get him to like another tier of strength, agility, and HP. So I decided to kind of come down towards Kimari's grid here. Uh, I didn't actually break out of anything because Kimari had already done that. And so I thought, you know what, in the early part of Kimari's grid, there is actually a decent amount of strength and HP. And so without really doing any kind of major breaking, I can actually get a nice little stat boost if I complete Kimari's little region of the grid. So because I knew what was to come and I knew that Seymour Flux was, was such a beast, I thought, let me just kind of get Tidus a little more powerful and then I can, I can kind of take things as I go. So once again, I didn't cash them all in. Uh, I'm trying to do this more like incrementally and just seeing like what the, the lowest stats are that I can get away with. And so I decided to not go like all in on Tyus' stats and just, just take the battle on and see where we were at. At this stage, like every plus four strength that you get is starting to make such a big difference. Like even Tyus' regular attacks are hitting for like 8,000 damage. And of course, there's a guaranteed quad nine pretty much if he's getting a critical hit. So it was looking very good on strength front and I didn't really need too much more than that at this point. So prepping for Seymour Flux, again, my first question was, is it gonna be the case that I can have whoever I want in the front line? I forgot if this was one of these mandatory ones where uh, the game forces you to fight with a specific lineup. So I wasn't too sure, but I prepared as if uh, I was gonna fight with these three. And so, of course, one thing I did know was that Seymour Flux has a big move once you get it below a certain amount of HP, a move that would do thousands of damage that I couldn't avoid. And so but that's why I gave Tidus the Soldier Targe. And basically, I tried to make these guys as tanky as possible to be able to survive the big attacks that Seymour Flux had under his belt. So that was my general kind of thinking. But unfortunately for Kimari, he didn't really have anything um, of that caliber, so nothing that could give him like a, a plus 20 or plus 30 percent HP gain. So for now, I decided to kind of just wait out and see what I could do. And I just gave him a little bit of zombie protection to kind of counteract his early moves. As you can see, I don't have enough elixirs for HP plus 20, so that was kind of out of the question at this point. So in terms of HP boosting armor, I didn't really have that many options or customization options at this point, but I was hoping to be able to get through and to be honest, if I couldn't, it just meant that I had to, to spend a little bit of time farming here and upping my HP to something high enough to actually get the win. So I switched Yuna over to that initiative just to increase my chances of potentially getting a preemptive strike here. And just as I was about to go in, of course, I had to encounter something else because of the horridly high encounter rate on Gagazette. So this is always annoying, but there's not too much you can do about it. I didn't farm for the no encounters weapon. 
but I did actually get a haste shield, funnily enough. So it's one of these, like, it, it happened a few times in this run where, like, an annoying encounter that I wished I never got ended up actually being quite fruitful. And this is one of those, so I got a, a, a free SOS haste armor that I just immediately equipped. And I thought, why the hell not? Because that could be potentially a difference maker in this challenge. So, yeah, I was going to say the Bashura uh, is another kind of enemy that you could be farming here because he does drop SOS haste relatively regularly. So it's not that difficult to get an SOS haste for most of your party members if you stick around here. So it was kind of funny that, again, it worked out that way because it wasn't really on my mind at first. And then when I got the drop, I was like, oh, shit, like, this is something that I could actually do. So, yeah, as you can see, you encounter the Bashuras quite frequently. And once I got the SOS haste, I was like, let me just overwrite my save because odds are I'm going to fail against Seymour Flux and I don't want to lose the, um, the SOS haste that I picked up. So I saved over and I, I went again for my attempt against Seymour Flux. I was really impatient at this point. I was like, I just want to get in there and fight this guy. But the game just keeps kind of stopping me with these encounters. So it was pretty funny. But eventually... I was ready to finally take on Seymour Flux. Actually, no, because I picked up a Moon Shield this time around. The, the, the RNG that I was getting with these drops was actually hilarious. So I quickly checked on my Moon Shield, and turns out I got an SOS Null Frost and an SOS Shell in the same armor. So guess what I did? I was like, okay, this is really cool. Let me go back and save again, because this is a rare drop that you're not going to be getting that frequently, and you don't want to lose that either. So literally two encounters that normally I would not have wanted to get both resulted in really clutch armors for Tidus as well so I mean that's just that's just really good RNG there's no other way to, to kind of put it and so this time third time lucky I actually got to face off with Seymour Flux and have my first attempt so let's see how this went with Yuna, I didn't actually know whether to go forwards or backwards here because I, I, I kind of end up in the middle of his grid but I decided to go backwards because um, there were definitely some strength spheres that I put along the way. Now, once I saw the 17 strength, I thought, at least for my first attempt, let me just see what happens if I have three normal physical attackers. Number one, will the game force me to have a different party set up? And two, if not, are these three going to be able to kind of brute force him and just do enough damage to take out Seymour Flux before he kills me? So I swapped in Waka for that reason, just to test what would happen. He was the one that had the Shaman Arm Guard, so I wanted to see what he could do with it. And so I took on Seymour Flux with the three Musketeers on my first attempt. Thankfully, cutscene skipping again, and you can see the auto battle is disabled here. Which ultimately, for me, was a good thing. So let's get started. Tidus with a big 6,000 damage, which was very motivating to see. And then, of course, Seymour came in with Lance of Atrophy, hit Tidus, and then Tidus replied immediately with another 6,500. So already, I was doing a lot of damage. But, of course, if you get hit with a zombie and you don't have Auto Phoenix, you're already done here. And so that was, of course, one thing that made me think, oh shit, I either need good zombie protection or I need Auto Phoenix in this battle. Otherwise, I can't win. So Kimari had Zombie Ward here. And as you can see, he didn't end up getting zombified. It is a 100% chance, so if you have a zombie ward, it falls to 50%. Now, everything's happening a bit fast here, but the general idea here is that Seymour Flux goes through phases. And one of the phases that he will do, as you can see, is to cast Protect on himself. And that's a Protect that you're not able to dispel here, because of course it's attack only. So this already meant that basically it ends up doubling his HP once you get him below a certain HP threshold. So even though he has 70,000 HP, it actually, the battle plays out as if he has a lot more. So at this point, I was starting to get a lot more worried. Cross Cleave does big damage. You've got Lance of Atrophy with its zombie attacks. You have Protect. And in general, Seymour Flux is pretty fast as well. So things were not looking so hot once I got going. I mean, I was happy with the, the first kind of damage numbers that I saw. But then things started to, to get a little more out of control. That being said, I did make it to his final and most dangerous phase. He casts Reflect and then he starts using Flare and he starts charging up for the big attack that is going to be the biggest problem of this particular battle. So multi or however the hell you pronounce it, is ready to annihilate and that is exactly what he's going to do. So Kimari is doing his best but eventually total annihilation comes and look at the damage numbers here.
816 once, twice, three times, four times, five times. So that's over 4,000 damage that you are forced to deal with that is pretty much unavoidable. So Seymour Flux, as you've seen there, there's positive signs, but also you can tell that he is going to be a significantly difficult boss. Now, the first thing that I thought to myself was, I can't afford to lose people in this battle. Um, I would have to either protect against Zombie and hope for some lucky RNG, or Yuna would have to play a part in this battle once again with her Auto Phoenix, because I just couldn't be letting people die that early in the battle. So that was the first kind of thing I had to solve in my mind, was to decide how was I going to set up for this battle. Uh, was I going to use Yuna, or was I going to try and kind of RNG my way out of it? Ultimately, this time I decided to keep Yuna in the front line, even if it meant lower damage output, because she had the Auto Phoenix, and it felt like it was pretty much essential in this battle, because no matter what happens, you can't have the zombie-proof armor here, so there is always a 50% chance you're going to get hit with that Lance of Atrophy and end up zombified and then taken out on the next move. So that's why I felt like she should stay around, and the longer I can obviously keep my team alive, the more chance I have of actually being able to take it out before Total Annihilation happens. So my first strategy was to basically try to blitz him out before Total Annihilation happens and wipes us all out. So this time around I decided to not use SOS Haste. My, my goal was a bit more like survival related. And so I picked an armor for Titus where I could customize another zombie ward onto it. And so I wanted to have as much like zombie protection as I could and then have Yuna with Auto Phoenix and see if I could survive and get by with that particular setup. So that was generally how attempt two was, was prepared and that's what I wanted to do. Zombie ward for Tidus and Kimari. I couldn't get one for Yuna obviously because I just didn't have enough slots, but I had to kind of take a chance and hope that Lance of Atrophy wouldn't hit Yuna and just see how we go from there. So let's fire up attempt number two. Thankfully you can choose the party members that you want in this battle by the way. So that's definitely very helpful. But yeah, Yuna having high strength here, if I took some time to, to really farm for stats uh, to give her a meaningful boost, that would have really helped. But what you're seeing here is basically what can go wrong. And so this attempt basically failed immediately. This was kind of pointless at this stage because once you lose Yuna um, and you don't have Auto Phoenix anymore, it's going to be pretty much no different from the last attempt unless maybe you get some incredible RNG. But no matter what happens, you won't be able to kill it before total annihilation especially because of protect and that's just going to be too strong for you to deal with so pretty much this attempt was already scrubbed and i was already ready to basically try again but wait for an attempt where yuna wasn't going to get hit with lance of atrophy to see if i could manage to to get any real progress going um, if i could keep yuna alive along with the rest of the team one thing that does happen is that you get a decent chunk of time before Total Annihilation happens. So I still wasn't super close here or anything, but honestly it was one of the, the worst attempts in the sense that Yuna died very quickly. Now, you could argue that Yuna died quickly, but as a result, Tidus and Kimari ended up basically staying alive for the entire battle. And so already I was pretty much close to maxing out the damage I could do. But I still just wanted an attempt where Yuna stayed alive just to see how different that could look. So I kept trying until I got the RNG that I wanted. So that was attempt two concluded. But once again, I was a little bit more hopeful this time around. And I figured that total annihilation was looking very difficult to avoid. And if I did have to deal with one, I just needed to have the brute HP and, and magic defense to be able to survive it. So it definitely seemed like having Yuna in the party was a good idea, but I definitely needed a, an attempt where she didn't get taken out so quickly. And I just wanted to see how that would play out. So I was again thinking maybe I should change to this one so that I can get um, Shell when I get below half HP during Total Annihilation. But I thought, you know what, screw it. Let's uh, let's stick with Haste because the, the chances of me surviving Total Annihilation is pretty low anyway. I mean, I've got 4,576 here. But the odds of me getting down to that stage with absolutely max HP was already very low. So it seemed a bit unlikely to me that this was going to work. But SOS Haste seemed like a potentially better option. So I kind of just stuck with that. And I wanted to see if I could if I could manage here. So um, that's what I did. I kept that for Tidus. And for Yuna, I decided to just equip her weapon that has a sensor on it. Because auto battle isn't working. So I'm able to actually see how much HP uh, Seymour Flux has. So it's a really nice way to keep track. 
and see how close I am to the win. So Tyus with SOS Haste, Kumari with Zombie Protection, and Yuna with a Sensor. I decided to give it another go and hope for some better RNG where I could really see how the battle would play out if Yuna didn't get taken out so quickly from the start. So that's what I tried to do. Now, what I will do is kind of show you an abridged version of the next bunch of attempts because for some strange reason, Seymour incessantly decided to attack Yuna first. So much so that at some point I decided to look it up to see if he was more like programmed to hit Yuna with the first Lance of Atrophy. But it turns out it was just really bad and annoying luck. And he just kept attacking Yuna over and over and over again. So we'll skip to the first attempt where that didn't actually happen. And then you can actually see what happens if Yuna manages to survive through the first Lance of Atrophy. Okay, so this time around, Tidus gets hit, and he replies with that nice 6,500 damage on the counter, and already we're in business. Protect comes very, very quickly. And so now I was looking to see how long we could survive for collectively before Total Annihilation happens, and whether we'd have the chance to do enough damage before it did. So yeah, Tidus gets taken out, of course, but comes straight back. And now we can get a better look. Unfortunately, on this particular attempt, I forgot to equip the, the Wisdom Staff for Yuna, so I didn't actually get to see how much damage I was doing. But I just wanted to get a feel for things if I was able to survive through to um, Total Annihilation. And so this is pretty perfect here, because what this means is that full life is only used once. So I'm doing enough damage with, with this particular setup that only one person dies as a result. Now, this was unfortunate. I had hoped that Yuna wouldn't get hit by that. But the fact that she did meant that pretty much everyone was going to die as a result of Total Annihilation. But at this stage, I was mostly curious to see how close I could get damage-wise and also how much damage Total Annihilation was going to do to Yuna specifically. So let's take a look here because this was a pretty pivotal point in the battle against Seymour Flux and trying to figure out how I could defeat it. So as you can see, not enough damage here to kill Seymour before Total Annihilation. But keep a close eye on the damage that everybody takes here and Yuna specifically compared to everybody else. As you can see, she is taking about 20 to 30% less damage than Tidus and Kimari. And so this means if she's taking on average about 600 damage per hit of the five hits that Total Annihilation does, a little bit of basic math tells us that she's taking about 3,000 damage from that particular attack. And so at this point, I was like, wait a minute. This means that this battle is very winnable because if Yuna survives through to Total Annihilation and if in the previous battle that flare didn't hit her, She's going to have full HP before it, she's going to survive it, and she's going to revive Tidus and Kimari, and then we're going to get a bunch more attacks to be able to defeat Seymour Flux before he can use a second Total Annihilation and take us out. So the plan had already formed in my mind, but Seymour once again decided to not play ball and just kept attacking Yuna from the start. So I had to throw away literally another handful of attempts before I had another good one where I could get the RNG that I wanted. So finally, after a bunch of unlucky attempts, we did have one with much better RNG. So we kick things off with Tidus, who does a nice 6,000. This time, Kimari takes the first one, but thankfully his zombie ward works, and he hits back for another 4,700 damage. So this was a really nice start. This was pretty perfect. Now we just had to see how far we could go, and if Yuna could retain her full HP all the way through to total annihilation. If that happened, I feel like I could win this battle. So let's see how this ended up going. Of course, full life uses here because Kimari's zombie ward actually worked this time around. And I did remember to give Yuna the Rod of Wisdom. So I was able to see how much HP Seymour had left as I continued the battle as well. So yeah, perfect. Second last of Atrophy hits Tidus. That's also fine. He does get zombified because he doesn't have zombie ward, but it's not too big a deal because he's going to go into this mode before the second full life. So that means that he's not going to slow us down by uh, trying to kill Tidus or anything like that. 
So, you can look at the number of turns left here. There's a decent chunk of turns to go before Total Annihilation. But in terms of the damage output, because of that pesky protect that he has, and the fact that Yuno obviously can't do any damage, it's just not good enough, unfortunately. So even Tidus here going into, into haste as a result of his SOS haste, I thought maybe that could make the difference, but ultimately you can see the damage is just not enough. Unfortunately, the, the idea of trying to defeat this guy before he even used the first Total Annihilation seemed almost impossible with the stats that I had. I'd probably have to get like six or seven critical hits or something like that uh, to be able to beat it before the first one. And as you've seen, I've literally got zero critical hits so far, which honestly, for a battle of this length and the fact that Tidus has like 10 more luck than base, or like eight more luck, it seemed a bit unlucky. But in any case, this was the perfect scenario. Yuna can tank this with her magic defense being so high. And because she has the Auto Phoenix armor, which I was so glad that I invested in on the high bridge, she can just do this. So this was perfection, and I thought to myself, now surely, before the next Total Annihilation, the boys should be able to take out Seymour, and we can move on. But 20,000 HP was still a lot, and after the first hit, I was like, you know what, maybe we don't have enough here. So we'll see what happens, but... Flare takes out Kimari, Auto Fiends kicks in. But it seemed increasingly unlikely that... Unless, again, we got some critical hits that we'd be able to, to get this done. But it was going to be very close, so I was pretty tense at this point to see if we could kind of get it done on time. So Seymour's going to skip the next turn. It's Morty's turn, not Seymour's turn, that results in the Annihilation. So this turn was going to be bypassed. Still no critical hits, unfortunately. So yeah, what we have left is one Kimari and one Tidus attack. And so now Tidus has to critical hit for us to be able to beat Seymour Flux here. He has to. There's no other choice. And he does not. So unfortunately, this good RNG attempt in terms of like the who got hit by which move was a bit of a bad RNG attempt in terms of Tidus or Kimari landing critical hits. We literally got a zero for the entire battle. And all we needed was one, really. So this was an unfortunate attempt still in some regards. But by this stage, it had become abundantly clear that we could definitely beat Seymour Flux here. Now, there was there was basically a choice to make. Either I could kind of hope for exactly the same battle, but just get a critical hit this time, or I could actually just level up Tidus a little bit more, just to have a tiny bit more strength. And at these kinds of levels, the, the way that strength scales is so powerful that even an extra three points, which Tidus got here, was going to make a meaningful difference to his damage output. So I decided to just literally work a few more sphere levels here. And I thought, let me try it again with Tidus having slightly more strength to see if I could pull this off. So that was all I changed, really. I didn't do too much. I gave Tidus slightly more strength and slightly more HP. And it was time to see if that would be enough to turn the corner and to put Seymour Flux away for good. So, of course, the next time I attempted it, Yuna got hit with the first Lance of Atrophy, so had to abandon that one. But thankfully, before long, the attempt that I wanted came along. And this time, things went my way, and we ended up getting the win. So, kick things off with Yuna once again, and Tidus comes in with an attack. Notice the damage here. About 900 to 1,000 higher than before, thanks to the plus 3. And Kimari hit back with a critical instantly. So already, Tidus did a thousand more damage and Kimari did an extra 4,700. So you can see that already I did enough damage where even if I did exactly what I did last time with zero criticals, I'd already be able to get through. So all I had to do was hope that Yuna survived until Total Annihilation and the win was mine. So this time around, you can see what it looks like when you have better RNG because Tidus hit a critical again, which meant an extra... 3,700 or so damage from him. Lovely. So at this point, I've already got about 10,000 free damage that I didn't get in my last unsuccessful attempt. So it really made a huge difference. And so this was the final thing that I needed here. The flare didn't kill Yuna, and so it meant that I was going to be fine. 
A bonus here was that Tylus got hit with the flare instead, and that put him into SOS Haze, which meant even more damage. But as you can see, even when things go perfectly here, pretty much with the setup that I have, this is basically perfect RNG, including a bunch of criticals as well. As you're seeing, it still wasn't enough to take Seymour out before Total Annihilation. So I think in order to do that, you really do need to have like a, I would say, maybe 8 to 10 more strength for Kimari and Tidus together. Or you need a character like Waka to have the Auto Phoenix instead. So with the setup that I had, this was still pretty much ideal. And once Yuna survives this Total Annihilation, I pretty much knew that it was going to be game over. It was just, again, such like validation for the grind, the mini grind that I ended up doing on the high bridge to get that auto thing. It just made all the difference. And it kind of made me wish that maybe I, gr I grinded for a bit longer and I had like another 20 or even 40 more Phoenix downs. I think like literally just giving everyone auto Phoenix at this point would have been huge. But one was already enough to defeat Seymour Flux, so I wasn't complaining here. Boom. I literally got a whole bunch of criticals this time. It really made a massive difference. But with that, the notorious, the infamous Seymour Flux was defeated in this challenge. So it was very, very glad to get through that one. And Yuna really did make all the difference there with her Auto Phoenix and her massive magic defense. Now, this was a nice bonus here. SOS Shell plus three free slots was definitely huge. And it was just a massive relief to finally get through this bit because... Seymour Flux is one of those bosses where, like, almost any challenge you do, no matter what, you're always just wary that something's going to go wrong, you're going to get stuck on him, it's going to be trouble. And, well, honestly, compared to some of the other bosses that I face, he's definitely up there in terms of the more difficult ones in this particular challenge. But beat him, I did. And so the story goes on. We are starting to really head towards, like, the end of the story here as we get towards uh, the final stages of Mount Gagazette and then on to Zanakin. So lots of exciting boss battles to come, of course, in the challenge. Hope you guys have been enjoying it so far. I'm looking forward to bringing you guys more and seeing how far I can take this. The fact that I've got through Flux definitely gives me confidence that I can really start to push through. And of course, I do have the scope to break out of my sphere grid to really just go to super OP stats if I have to do it in order to complete the story. So I think you are gonna be able to see pretty much the entire story of this game being defeated with auto battle or attack only, but you're just going to have to watch the videos to find out if I can do it, and if I did, how. So that's it for this video. I will be back with more from Gagazette, because we are going to encounter some more interesting random encounters. Everything in Gagazette so far has been very easy, but again, experienced players would have already thought about an encounter in the Gagazette caves that could prove a bit more difficult than what I've been facing so far. And then from there, we'll be moving to Sanctuary Keeper, hopefully defeating that, and then on to the magical Zanakin Ruins, which starts off so beautiful, but then can become so haunting as you get towards the Spectral Keeper boss, and then, of course, the infamous Unileska. So, a lot of really cool stuff still to come. Thank you guys, as always, for the support. This series has been an absolute gem. It's just combined so many things that have been really good for me, being a content creator who loves Final Fantasy X in a positive way that it's just been an absolutely magic series in that sense. Like everything from the fact that I am of course already a massive Final Fantasy X fan, the entire premise of this channel and one of the things I love most about this game and what kept me hooked and made me obsessed with this game is the challenges that you can do with it. And the fact that I enjoy challenges anyway is just super cool. And so combining those two things, which is helping me have like a fresh perspective and a very unique way to play it compared to any other run that I've done in the past, all of those elements have made it really special from like a, a personal point of view, just in terms of the playing and the recording and the having fun part of it. But then also for, in terms of the channel, it's a different type of content to what I normally make. Like the editing is different, the voiceover style is different, the presentation is different, the upload schedule is different, the way that I promote it is different. Like everything is different in that sense. And even though it's not groundbreaking in terms of its creativity for my channel and the kind of stuff that I've been doing, 
it's really been a breath of fresh air and I've really enjoyed actually creating the content too. And of course the icing on the cake has been the incredible response from you guys and just the sheer success of the series compared to the day-to-day -day stuff that I do on the channel. I can't thank you guys enough. Even on Patreon, there's been a lot of new patrons coming in and supporting and you guys are just like eager for more of this and wanting to see more of the content. It's really been an absolute pleasure to play through this and to see all of the support coming in. Really appreciate you guys. Thank you to all of the new patrons as well. I have noticed a, a noticeable uptick in new patrons. And so thank you to everybody that's joined up recently as well. It really does mean a lot. And hopefully I'll be able to bring you more episodes from this challenge and hopefully more of this type of content in the future. It's a really nice kind of content to sprinkle in among all of the day-to-day -day stuff that I do. And it's really nice to, to bring me back to like my challenge roots and to enjoy these games in a unique and fresh way. So thank you all for watching. Hopefully lots of cool stuff still to come from this particular challenge. I will see you soon. Take care.